Why should we give land to the Indians when it clearly says on the paper it belonged to the farmers? But surely you must realize that this is their home. These indigenous tribes have been living on this land for hundreds of years. Listen, this war is not fair. Some people win, some people lose. The whole world thinks they can tell Brazil what to do with her land. Sorry, no. We do what we please. Nuestra tierra siempre está en movimiento. Una sinfonía dinámica de fuerzas que trabajan juntas para llevar vida a cada rincón del planeta. Por miles de años, las culturas del mundo la han llamado su madre. incredibly beautiful planet, a home that we will hopefully pass on to generations to come. But as the years go by, it's becoming increasingly hard to imagine what kind of a world we're leaving behind us. We've spent the last four years traveling around the world, filming the stark reality that people now face from the threat of ecological collapse. It's now become very clear to us that there's one thing driving the destruction of our ecosystems faster than anything else. Let us show you how this very same thing might just also be our salvation. environmental scientists warn that we are fast approaching the point of no return if we don't make a substantial course reversal. We see really serious catastrophic effects in the next few years, certainly in the next decade or two. The world will be com completely different from the way it is now. Desde el año 1900, las catástrofes climáticas han aumentado drásticamente. En los últimos 50 años, estas catástrofes aumentaron cuatro veces más que en los 100 años anteriores. We began to work together to move this issue onto the global center stage. There was a lot of discussion about the contribution from uh, buildings and from industrial factories, uh, but I became aware during that same period of time that there was another factor that was going undiscussed. And that is the role of animal and agriculture, which I could see was playing some significant role around the planet. But this was the elephant in the room no one wanted to talk about. Whatever environmental issue you want to look at, from you know, species loss to water pollution to water use to climate change, animal agriculture is one of the top causes. The critical widespread negative impact of animal agriculture on our planet is undeniable. Severe global crises from climate change and environmental damage to species extinction, hunger, poverty, disease, and antibiotic resistance, all of these have direct connections to animal agriculture and the massive inefficiency of our current food production systems. 
En el 2009, un reporte de Wikileaks reveló las conversaciones entre ejecutivos de Nestlé y funcionarios estadounidenses llamadas The Tour the Horizon. Los ejecutivos de Nestlé dijeron que según sus investigaciones, el agua dulce del mundo se acabaría en los próximos 30 años. Y afirmaron que una de las razones más grandes de esta catástrofe es la demanda mundial de productos cárnicos. If you look at the the impact that food choice has on on global warming, it's very significant. Eating meat is huge for global climate, and that's something where personal choice is the determining factor. So there's the only case I can think of where individual human choice would have a big effect would be uh, food. We're now over the line. And the idea that we're going to double meat production between now and 2050, this is just unsustainable. This is going to have to give. Our diet is taking us to an abyss. A significant reason why livestock production has been having such a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions is because of the large surfaces of forests that have been destroyed in order to make room for pastures and for the uh, growth of soybean and maize uh, for feedstock production. Nuestros bosques estaban llenos de una diversidad de vida increíble. Pero desde hace unos años, nuestro apetito insaciable por la carne y los lácteos aumentó. Y al aumentar la demanda de carne, necesitábamos más y más tierra. Y así talamos y quemamos la naturaleza virgen, destruyendo todo a nuestro paso, haciendo lugar para los animales que tanto deseábamos comer. Estos animales no podían estar sueltos como en su hábitat natural. Y fue así que las zonas de pastoreo rápidamente se quedaron vacías. Y claro, había que alimentarlos. Una vez más, talamos y quemamos más y más bosques. Sembramos maíz y soya transgénicos que luego bañamos con pesticidas, herbicidas y fertilizantes químicos sintéticos. La agricultura animal literalmente cambió el aspecto de nuestro planeta. El color verde son los cultivos de consumo humano, un área extensa que recorre el globo. En cambio, la agricultura animal que aparece en color rojo ocupa una enorme superficie terrestre. De hecho, mucho más grande que la de consumo humano. Almost all the Earth's surface is now bears the mark of some kind of human impact. And most of that is livestock production. Agriculture has transformed the planet like nothing else. To produce milk, we farm an area about the size of Brazil. To produce beef, we farm an area about the size of Canada, the United States, the whole of Central America, Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador combined. To produce eggs, we farm an area the size of Sweden. To produce aquaculture feed, an area about the size of the UK. A plant-based diet would reduce the amount of land required to produce our food by 3.1 billion hectares. That's an area the size of the entire African continent. El Amazonas es la selva tropical más grande del mundo. Este mundo antiguo y rico en biodiversidad está siendo reemplazado lentamente. Comúnmente se cree que la soya que se planta en Brasil es para consumo humano. En realidad, menos del 6% de la soya que se cultiva en el mundo es para alimentar a los humanos. La gran mayoría se planta para crear alimento de ganado. La soya se exporta a todo el mundo para alimentar a los billones de pollos, peces de granja, cerdos y vacas que comemos a diario. Los bosques no son solo el hogar de millones de especies de fauna silvestre y plantas, son grandes reguladores de la atmósfera del planeta. Día a día y lentamente respiran y capturan dióxido de carbono, produciendo billones de toneladas de oxígeno fresco al aire. Se estima que cada año 7.3 millones de hectáreas de bosques se pierden. Esto equivale aproximadamente al tamaño de Panamá. Se piensa que la mitad de los bosques tropicales maduros del mundo han sido destruidos. 
y los científicos aseguran que si no se toman medidas importantes a nivel mundial, para el año 2030 solo sobrevivirá el 10% de los bosques. One of the most precious things we have in the world is our rainforests. The rainforests are literally being uh, chewed away um, by farmers who know they can make money by cutting another acre and then another acre and then another acre for need. Nossa avó, naquele tempo, o cacique, então, já falou, olha, você vai sofrer muito, porque o branco, o ruralismo. Cada ano, cientos de pessoas de las tribus originárias de la selva amazônica são testigos de la queima de suas aldeias. Les quitan suas tierras a la fuerza e muitos são asesinados por paramilitares de la agroindustria que buscan convertir seus hogares em la selva em terrenos para sembrar soja e producir alimento para o ganado. Una de las tribus más afectadas es la Guaraní Cayoguá, en Mato Grosso do Sul. Para nosotros indígenas, antiguamente, la floresta aquí es nuestra casa. Quien comenzó a destruir a nuestra aldea es a través de la agropecuaria. Derrubaram as nossas matas, destruindo os animais, os rios. Eu estou falando, é, agora vai plantar soja, aí depois vai passar veneno, né, tudo coisa. Vai passar adubro também, vai cair tudo no rio. E é, nós é, é, revoltando no seu para para sustentar a nossa família. Né? So there was actually a report that came out in 2018 and they found that the world's top five livestock corporations now release more annual greenhouse gas emissions than ExxonMobil, Shell and BP. It is crazy when you think about it because the EU is spending 24 billion pounds of taxpayers' money on livestock farming each year. And this is at a time when we are facing an ecological collapse and we drastically need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So it's no surprise that people are asking a lot of questions now about the fact that there seem to be some serious conflicts of interest going on here. There's some very heavy lobbying going on of government, and I think that happens throughout the world. And it's just a historic thing that needs to be, I think, rebalanced. As I've mentioned to you over the phone, um, I've worked with a number of large livestock companies around the world. Um, so the way it works is that a representative from or, uh, pays us usually being up to half a million euros. We then target the relevant uh, politicians from different governments around the world and motions are made to pass legislation in favour of the company's business strategies. For environmental policy, we can be very persuasive in order to abolish or, or, or heavily relax environmental regulations in government so our clients have more freedom in their work. Uh, I mean, the other day we managed to kill proposed legislation that would have had a, a huge impact on the industry based on a report from the UNFAO. You know, the industry is, is just concerned with growth, but the environmental data that's coming out now, it's, it's really making that difficult for them. Today, 
democracy does not always function as well as it should because of the huge influence that uh, agribusiness corporations and livestock producers in particular exercise on decision making. A former director of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, Dr. Samuel Jatsi, warned as far back as 2010 that interventions by agribusiness lobbyists were blocking reforms that would offer better standards for human health and preserving the environment. Big animal agribusiness corporations and food producers' influence over political decisions about the regulation of their industry has long been a concern for campaigners who see the narrow interests of the industry taking widespread control. If we have any doubt about how powerful this influence is, we can recall that, for example, when the Advisory Committee on Dietary Guidelines in the US made recommendations to the US government as to how dietary guidelines should be shaped, they were blocked by this very powerful lobby of agribusiness interests. In 2013, the Organization of the Nations Unidas for Alimentation and Agriculture published an informe called Enfrenting the Climate Change Through the Agriculture. The report explains that the raising of animals is responsible for more emissions of gas effect than the sum of all the means of transport in the world. Cada vez más científicos aseguran que el impacto de la agricultura animal es de hecho peor que lo publicado por el reporte de la FAO. There are close ties between the research organizations and governments and government policy and industry. It's very pervasive because livestock industries depend on government policies that support them. The FAO report um, was prepared within the FAO by specialists of agriculture and livestock production, not by specialists of the environmental issues associated with uh, agricultural production. I believe that a more serious concern, of course, is that the International Meat Association was involved in preparing the report, which does raise the question of the independence with which the study was prepared. Government policy in that regard is not for the benefit of the land, it's for the benefit of the industry. La FAO realizó el informe en conjunto con países miembros, organizaciones no gubernamentales, la Federación Europea de Fabricantes de Alimentos Compuestos, la Federación Internacional de Productos Lácteos, la Oficina Permanente Internacional de la Carne, la Comisión Internacional del Huevo y el Consejo Internacional de Avicultura. En una industria valorada en más de un trillón de dólares, no son justamente estas instituciones las que se verían más afectadas si se publica un informe científico en contra de la agricultura animal. Hay pocas personas que conocen el océano como la doctora Sylvia Earle. La doctora Earle fue la primera mujer en servir como directora científica de la Oficina Nacional de Administración Oceánica y Atmosférica de los Estados Unidos y batió el récord histórico de inmersión libre más profunda y prolongada en el mar. When I was a child, the idea of a dead zone in the ocean was, was not even in our vocabulary. But in the 20th century, as agriculture began to greatly expand, the areas around the coast began to show signs of wear and tear. The first most notorious spotlight area, I think, was off the Gulf of Mexico. And it has simply grown over the years, an annual phenomenon that is coincident with the application of massive amounts of fertilizer. In millions of hectares where we plant the alimento of the animals we eat, we use a huge amount of excessive fertilizers. The nitrogen is escaped with the water of the river or the rain to the rivers and ends in the oceans. La presencia excesiva de nitrógeno en el agua estimula la sobrepoblación de algas, lo que lleva a una proliferación tan grande que se puede ver desde el espacio. Las algas absorben el oxígeno del agua causando la muerte de la vida acuática alrededor de ellas. A medida que aumenta la demanda por la carne, crece la cantidad de zonas muertas con bajos niveles de oxígeno. hundreds of dead zones that have developed all around the coastlines of the world. And 
Okay, people say, that's, that's too bad for the fish. So sorry, fish. But we need to understand that what we do to the ocean, we're doing to ourselves. I want others to see and, and to see for themselves. This is all we've got, this little blue miracle. Algunos creen que al dejar de comer carne roja y en su lugar comer pescado, están ayudando a nuestro planeta. Este concepto no podría estar más alejado de la realidad. Si el océano muere, nosotros morimos con él, ya que cada molécula de oxígeno que inhalamos es creada por nuestro océano. La revista científica Nature reportó que desde los años 50, el 90% de los peces grandes del océano ha desaparecido. Uno de los estudios más completos realizados sobre las poblaciones de peces publicado en Nature dice que, si el ritmo de pesca actual continúa, las pesquerías del mundo colapsarán en menos de 30 años. Según la IPES, la plataforma intergubernamental que evalúa el estado de la biodiversidad, la causa principal de la extinción de animales acuáticos es la pesca. Nuestro gusto por el pescado está dejando literalmente a los océanos sin vida. Today we have agreed on fishing opportunities for European fishermen worth more than 5 billion euros and benefiting more than 50,000 fishermen. The catches agreed today will continue to make the European fishing industry highly profitable also in 2019. país hermoso con paisajes imponentes. Es también un lugar que guarda secretos oscuros. Noruega es uno de los grandes exportadores de peces de cultivo del mundo, una industria que aporta billones de euros a la economía nacional. Debido a la disminución de las grandes poblaciones de peces al borde de la extinción, los pescadores recurren a la acuicultura y crían peces en un ambiente controlado. Noruega produce la mayor cantidad de salmón y bacalao cultivado en granja del mundo. Alrededor del 70% del pescado que comemos hoy proviene de criaderos artificiales. Al criar miles de peces en jaulas pequeñas con poco espacio, se facilita la expansión de enfermedades y parásitos. Esto es un gran problema para la industria. Como resultado, se intensificó el uso de pesticidas, desinfectantes y antibióticos para así lograr que los peces sobrevivan lo suficiente hasta llegar al mercado. 
Para desparasitar a los peces, se utilizan barcos especiales con una especie de aspiradora acuática gigante que los saca del agua. Los peces son bombeados a presión por un sistema en donde se les calienta a altas temperaturas o se les baña en una sustancia química que les quita la mayoría de los parásitos y finalmente se les devuelve las jaulas. Para matar parásitos y tratar las enfermedades, los peces son bañados en químicos como el peróxido de hidrógeno y asametifos. Su alimento, además, contiene químicos como el teflubensurón, emamectin y diflubensurón, que por su naturaleza son tóxicos. Los investigadores aseguran que estas sustancias químicas terminan en los peces y, por consecuencia, en nuestros platos. Esto le sucede a todos los peces de cultivo en el mundo entero. La ambientalista Taryn Bishop se va a reunir con Green Warriors, una organización para la preservación del medio ambiente ubicada en Bergen, en la costa occidental de Noruega. Hace años que Green Warriors investiga los efectos devastadores de las piscifactorías en el ecosistema local y hoy llevarán a Taryn a conocer los secretos que se esconden en las profundidades de los criaderos. Un sumergible especialmente construido les permite observar la superficie debajo de las jaulas. A lo largo del fondo del océano se encuentra una gruesa capa de lodo compuesta de desechos de peces, bacterias y restos de alimentos. El fango está lleno de pesticidas de los alimentos. Estudios recientes han demostrado que los efectos del uso excesivo de pesticidas en los ecosistemas acuáticos de los criaderos son devastadores para la biodiversidad marina. Además, el fango genera grandes emisiones de metano, un gas de efecto invernadero. Investigadores de la Universidad de Oxford afirman que algunos tipos de acuicultura producen más metano que la producción de carne de res. Liv Humphrey es la directora del Consejo de Administración de Pesca de Noruega. Estando aquí, nos informaron que es la encargada de regular la industria pesquera del país y además es accionista de una de las empresas de piscicultura más grandes en Noruega. Muchos grupos ambientalistas creen que esto es un gran conflicto de intereses. Humphrey se reunirá con Taryn para responder preguntas sobre el estado de los criaderos de peces en Noruega. Well, fish farming is quite a new industry in Norway. It started back in the 1960s with some local uh, entrepreneurs starting with hobby, and it's grown until it's a billion uh, euro industry today. And um, seafood is the second largest export industry in Norway, and fish farming accounts for two thirds of the export value of seafood. So recently, We found out that you also have shares in one of the largest fish farm companies in Norway. Do you not feel that that's a conflict of interest? Uh, of course, there could be a con uh, in conflict of interest, uh, but this is a fact that's been known since before I got this position, and I've been open about it. I do not. I'm not involved in the business from uh, day to day or at any so it's and if there's um, uh, we have and um, I have so I have to do you have to start over again uh, so all the decisions that I made will either be for the whole industry not especially for this fish farm or it's only an advice to the politicians, and the politicians are setting the limits and the actual regulations. So if there's an actual case uh, handling regarding this company, then I will step aside. On a few jobs, and I was working here over the years as a diver. We used to be around the fish farms cleaning the, the dead, deceased fish from the nets. 
and uh, fixing the nets, etc. after storms. And on occasion, we'd seen some of the boats coming in to clean the uh, lice off them. It's quite a lot of dead fish, you know, diseased or they've died, but it's a lot of pink mush, you know, not, 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 uh, not healthy look. Having seen what I've seen and worked on the various sites around about where I've been in Scotland, I, I wouldn't eat farmed salmon. Uh, no, I would have <laughs> and pretty, pretty rank. Salmon is marketed as healthy. It's also marketed in, in, in a very devious way, deceptive way, that they think it's a wild product. So it's a fake product, it's a fatty product, it's contaminated, it's marketed as healthy, but, it, but it's not. So salmon, if you see salmon, alarm bells should start ringing. It's pretty grim when you dive down to the bottom of the cages because, you know, we always see the bottom full of dead fish. And it's basically because many of these fish are so diseased, so parasite-ridden and laden with chemicals that they become sick and they live out their sad, short lives basically looking like zombies. You know, you don't see this when you go to the restaurant or the supermarket, but this is basically what a lot of the fish actually look like before it ends up on our plates. So tonight, Don wanted to show us how much of the farmed fish actually dies. Because of the very unnatural and unsanitary ways that they are kept, and they have rows of very large metal containers that they are constantly filling up with the dead fish. And I have to say that the smell as we get closer is actually pretty disgusting. So this is the sordid side of salmon farming in Scotland. This is the, the dirty secrets the industry don't want you to see. This is disease-ridden farm salmon. It's 15 to 20% fat. That's where the contaminants, the cancer-causing contaminants, PCBs, dioxins, and the artificial colorings are. So this is something to be avoided at all costs. This is the salmon farm, just here. We got freedom of information data from the Scottish Environment Protection Agency showing the use of over 50 tonnes of formaldehyde, not just at this site, but other sites across Scotland, is formaldehyde may cause cancer, suspected of causing genetic defects, toxic if swallowed, may cause respiratory irritation, causes damage to organs, do not breathe. One of the fish farm workers told us that the workers um, come down to the farm um, early in the morning, spraying the chemicals into the fish cages. So they're obviously spraying something down there in the water. The guy who gave us the tip off said that toxic chemicals are widely used across Scotland, including formaldehyde and also hydrogen peroxide. And these are supposed to treat the diseases and lice problems which are both rampant across the fish farms. You know, these are not chemicals that you want in your body. Whatever he's spraying must be pretty powerful if he needs to wear a full protective chemical suit and a face mask. Desde que el océano se convirtió en el basurero de 7 billones de personas y los piscicultores saturan a los peces con alimentos químicos, comer pescado nunca ha sido tan tóxico. 
You know, our oceans have become humanity's sewers. Everything eventually flows into the sea. So if you had a, you know, time machine that go back before the Industrial Revolution, it's a different story. But now, the highest levels of many of these persistent organic pollutants, we're talking about, you know, DDT and PCBs and uh, dioxins, the highest levels in our food supply are found in the aquatic food chain. Fish are not the safest choice anymore. So, Tony, it's great to see you. Great to see you as well. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Not at all. Thank you. A pleasure being here. So I wanted to ask you if you could share with us what, is, what exactly it was you began to feel when you realized something was going wrong. I was exhausted more than usual. And then I was losing short-term memory, and that scared the hell out of me. And then I tore my rotator cuffs in a really intense snowboarding accident. And the doctor said, do you want to do your metals test? And I said, ah, I got my amalgams out 25 years ago. He goes, there's so many metals in the environment, you should do it. So I did, I get a phone call a week later, and I said to my assistant, just have him send the report. And he said, no, it's an emergency, he has to speak to you. I was like, no one wants to hear that. And so I called him up and he said, Tony, I showed your blood tests. You have extreme mercury poisoning. On a zero to five scale, which is what we measure, five being toxic, you're 123. The doctor said, how long has this man been in the hospital? And I just got off stage. So I, I, I said, I can't understand this. So I, I went out and they thought, you know, maybe someone was trying to poison me because the number was so high. And I was very disciplined. I was a vegan for 12 years, and then I just went salad fish, salad fish. And they brought the medical group out here, and they looked at it, and I found this man named Dr. Shade, who's the only guy who has an ideation process where you can see where the mercury came from, and it was fish. Mm -hmm. It's been three years, um, and I had some severe moments. It burned a hole in my esophagus, and I literally collapsed. I lost a third of my blood supply. I could have died. I lost half my hemoglobin. People begin to lose their hair, yes. their memory. They lose their memories, as you were doing, as you, yes. no, as you yes. noticed. But they can also have headaches. They can complain of fatigue. Um, they can also have depression. What we're seeing now is with the toxic environmental exposure, and especially with the mercury, methyl mercury in fish, is that everyone has got to be careful because yes. the levels are going up. Udo, tell me, because your specialty is in this, how do you get the fish oils that we all need for the brain and for the body uh, if we can't have fish? What, what do you suggest? Well, we used to get them from fish oils. Yes. And, but we can actually get them from vegetables. Flax is the richest source of omega-3 that we everybody thinks should come from fish oil. If you get enough of that as starting material, your body will make what the fish oils make and it'll be clean. Many people take fish oils or have fish for the long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And you have to ask yourself the question, well, where do the fish get them from? And it turns out they get them from the algae in the ocean. They get them from plant food. So if you want the purest form of the long chain ready-made omega-3 fatty acids, the best way of doing that is simply to take an algae supplement because then you've got the purest form of it and you don't have the extra risks of having the toxins and the heavy metals and the saturated fat and the cholesterol that you would get from eating a fish. Investigadores del Instituto Scripps de Oceanografía de UC San Diego realizaron uno de los estudios más completos del mundo sobre la presencia de contaminantes en el pescado. Los expertos encontraron contaminantes tóxicos en los peces de todos los océanos del mundo. Nobody would go to the nearest body of water and put in like a cup and drink the water. Um, you're, you're basically getting the concentrated toxins if we're eating fish. Nuestros océanos también se han llenado de plástico. Como nuestros océanos son tan grandes, es un reto para cualquier científico entender de dónde viene la mayor parte del plástico. La gran isla de basura del Pacífico tiene una superficie de 1.6 millones de kilómetros cuadrados y representa una gran oportunidad de entender mejor el problema de los microplásticos en el mar. Un grupo de científicos de la organización Ocean Cleanup lleva tiempo estudiando la isla. Se sorprendieron al descubrir que gran parte del plástico no proviene de los popotes o pajitas o de las botellas de agua sino de las miles de toneladas de equipos de pesca abandonados que son triturados por el mar en trillones de fragmentos de microplástico. La revista Nature publicó recientemente un estudio que revela que el 80% del plástico en el Pacífico proviene de equipos de pesca abandonados. Los científicos aseguran que el acto más grande que podemos hacer como individuos para resolver el problema de los océanos de plástico es dejar de comer pescado, y optar por una dieta basada en plantas. At least half of the plastic in the sea today comes from discarded or lost fishing gear. Because all those nets, all those lines, all that stuff, it's, it's just become a plasticized ocean. But we have a chance. 
We have a chance right now to change our eating habits. There's an estimate that there's over five trillion tons of plastic currently floating in the ocean. It's absolutely everywhere. Everywhere we look, we found microplastics, whether it's at the polar regions, in remote islands. Also, if we're looking on the surface or the seabed, and everywhere in between, we find microplastics. We've also found microplastics in just about every animal group that we've looked in. We've been sampling for microplastics for quite a while now, and we found that there's 27 times more bits of plastic than there are fish larvae. El microplancton vive en todos los océanos. Se alimentan por filtración. Cuando los investigadores agregan microplásticos en el ambiente del plancton, se puede observar cómo ingieren las partículas de plástico. Sin saber que esas partículas tienen químicos tóxicos, el plancton las consume indiscriminadamente. Los investigadores observan cómo los químicos se acumulan en los órganos de estas criaturas marinas. Los peces grandes se alimentan del plancton tóxico. Los investigadores han descubierto que gran parte del pescado que comemos hoy contiene bioacumulación de estos químicos en su carne. realizado por la Universidad de Plymouth concluyó que más de un tercio de los peces examinados tenía microplásticos. Al comer pescado contaminado, estos químicos tóxicos entran en nuestro cuerpo. Estudios recientes sugieren que la misma acumulación tóxica ocurre en seres humanos. Our scientists tell us we're now in the sixth extinction event of life on this Earth. It doesn't even make the headlines. No one even knows about it. ตอนนี้น่ะวะคุกเก็บเป็นเธอน่ะอัตเตนะคืนนี้เธอสายติดตาดีเซตเซเมตานี้เธอสายนั่นเหรอเด็กยันนี้เธอสายปอตรยันน
it's up to all of us to make sure that um, this doesn't happen in the future. Today, over 26,000 species are currently threatened with extinction, and the most important driver of that is our use of land for agriculture. Over time, um, livestock have been a major, major driver of biodiversity loss. Some have predicted that by 2045, the species loss will be so great that we won't recover. The earth will suffer ecological collapse. And the biggest thing you and I can do is change our diet. Algunos científicos llaman a esta crisis una aniquilación biológica. Según la revista Science of the Total Environment de la Universidad Internacional de Florida, la ganadería es la causa principal de la pérdida de biodiversidad. Un estudio de la revista Science estimó que si toda la población mundial cambiara a una dieta exclusivamente basada en plantas, se liberaría el 75% de terreno cultivable y muchos de los bosques que se talaron con fines ganaderos se podrían recuperar. Hay muchas excelentes iniciativas en el mundo enfocadas justo en eso. Ecosia, un motor de búsqueda similar a Google, es una de ellas. Dona los ingresos que recibe de los anuncios a las comunidades locales para la restauración forestal. Uno de los silvicultores de Ecosia es Mauricio, quien trabaja para reforestar la selva amazónica de Brasil. Planté mi primera árbol, tenía cinco años de edad. Yo ni imaginaba que 20 años después, eh, ese esfuerzo tan pequeño tería virado una de las iniciativas que más plantó árboles en la historia del Brasil. Foram mais de 2 milhões e meio de árvores, 2 mil hectares plantados, muitas áreas preservadas pela ação de combate a incêndios florestais. Os árvores respiram vida para nosso planeta. Cada vez que plantamos un árbol, sembramos las semillas de nuestro futuro en este mundo. El estudio más completo y reciente sobre el impacto de nuestra dieta en el medio ambiente es un estudio llevado a cabo por un equipo internacional de investigadores. Según este estudio, encabezado por el Dr. Marcos Springman de la Universidad de Oxford en Inglaterra, para mantener la temperatura por debajo del peligroso umbral de 2 grados Celsius que se pactó en el Acuerdo de París, los países de altos ingresos deben reducir drásticamente el consumo de carne roja en un 80%. Policymakers have been very, very reluctant to address the livestock issue. It's entirely out of keeping with the urgency of the crisis that we're facing. Hi, Otto Brockway for Brockstar Films. Um, this is a question for Commissioner Hogan. The scientists at Oxford University have been very clear that livestock farming has a far greater impact than plant-based farming. With this in mind, would it not be common sense to reduce the billions in subsidy payments to livestock farming in Europe and offer them to plant-based farming instead as an incentive to a much more sustainable food system? We have made our proposals based on protecting the farmers uh, because they are, unlike you and I, they're out in all sorts of weathers and in all sorts of market risks. And you and I may not know anything about that because this is their lives. This is, they're producing high quality food for us all so that we can have this particular good quality products available to us at all times. Sometimes under local conditions like organic, more times it's conventional farming. So we provide financial support at the moment for that. And it's a public good that's not always recognized. But the movement of our policy is in the direction of our farmers being centrally involved in providing more public goods. And if you want to do anything in life, you have to pay people. Sometimes I understand that there's a moral obligation and there's people of principle. But most of the time, 99% of the time, they have to get paid. So as professionals that we're expecting to provide good quality food and do more on public goods, we pay our farmers. This is the decision that we make at political level. Livestock emit methane and nitrous oxide. Now, most people, when they think of climate change, they think of CO2, carbon dioxide, which is a very potent global warming gas. But methane is 25 times more potent per molecule when it's released than CO2. 
and nitrous oxide is 298 times more potent per molecule than CO2. These are very powerful global warming gases. So today we have a very special camera um, called a hyperspectral imaging camera. And it basically enables us to be able to see gases that would be otherwise invisible to the naked eye. And today we're looking at methane gas. Methane is a gas that is being produced by cows when they belch. El gas metano, junto con los otros gases que produce en la atmósfera, es el responsable de un tercio del calentamiento global desde 1750. La ganadería es la fuente más grande de metano que el humano puede controlar. La disminución drástica de emisiones de metano puede frenar el calentamiento global de 15 a 25 años. Es la manera más efectiva de frenarlo en los años críticos que tenemos por delante. Wow, look at that. Wow. Para demostrar los diferentes potenciales de calentamiento de los gases de efecto invernadero, veamos el experimento de absorción de infrarrojo. Observemos estas cuatro esferas de hielo con forma de la Tierra dentro de cámaras herméticas e individuales. Las cámaras representan la atmósfera que rodea al planeta. Por encima, colocamos calefactores infrarrojos, todos a la misma temperatura, y llenamos cada una con un gas diferente. La primera cámara se llena con aire normal, como el que respiramos a diario. La segunda cámara se llena con dióxido de carbono, el gas de efecto invernadero más conocido. La tercera cámara se llena con metano, un gas asociado con la agricultura animal. Y la cuarta cámara se llena con óxido nitroso, también asociado con la agricultura animal. Después de un tiempo, observamos que la esfera de hielo expuesta al dióxido de carbono se derrite lentamente comparada con la expuesta al aire normal. En ese mismo tiempo, las esferas con metano y óxido nitroso se derriten rápidamente debido a que la temperatura dentro de las cámaras es considerablemente mayor a las del aire normal e incluso de dióxido de carbono. 16 horas después, los resultados son impactantes. Vemos claramente que el metano y el óxido nitroso, los gases producidos por la agricultura animal, son gases de efecto invernadero muy potentes. De los 70 billones de animales terrestres que se crían para el consumo humano cada año en el mundo, cerca del 90% son pollos. Un problema que crece es que el consumo del pollo está aumentando. Aunque el impacto ambiental del pollo es menor que el de la carne roja, más del 90% del pollo en el mundo ahora se cría de forma intensiva, con efectos devastadores para nuestro planeta. Si comparamos las calorías por proteína de la carne y proteínas basadas en plantas como los garbanzos, el pollo hace menos daño ambiental que las carnes rojas consumidas comúnmente. Sin embargo, aún genera 40 veces más calentamiento climático por caloría de proteína que los garbanzos y consume 50 veces más agua. We know that if we would shift from uh, ruminant meats to other meats, then we probably would reduce uh, our footprint just from, from that particular product by about a factor of 10, which is quite a bit. Uh, but if you compare that with how much you would reduce uh, your footprint if you went to plant-based products, that is a, about a factor of 100. Uh, and that's the reason why shifting to more, towards more plant-based diets has such a big impact, because we're really talking about different scales here. Es común escuchar que la carne orgánica tiene un menor impacto ambiental y climático. Sin embargo, investigadores de la Universidad de Oxford reportaron que tanto la producción de carne orgánica como la convencional emiten casi la misma cantidad de gases de efecto invernadero. So in our data, we didn't find big differences between organic and conventional across multiple indicators. What we did find is that no matter how you produce animal products, even the lowest impact forms of production still create higher emissions and use more land than typical vegetable proteins. So that's saying something really important. That's saying that even if you go into the shops and try and purchase sustainable meat or dairy, it's always going to be better to purchase vegetable proteins instead. 
Cada año el gobierno de Estados Unidos paga 20 millones de dólares para subsidiar el cultivo de frutas y verduras. Pero la producción cárnica y láctea recibe una suma masiva de 38 billones de dólares del gobierno. Se estima que el costo anual para los contribuyentes de Estados Unidos destinados a enfermedades relacionadas con el consumo de carne y lácteos es de 314 billones de dólares. Y cuando, you know, cram, you know, tens of thousands of animals in these cramped, filthy, unhygienic conditions, basically live atop their feces, it's just like a breeding ground. Animal to human diseases that arise um, because of the way we're now treating animals, whether it's these live animal markets in East Asia, um, whether it's the bushmeat trade. And the concern is that with enough spins at genetic roulette, on these swine factory farms, these chicken factory farms, we're gonna, you know, end up with one of these viruses that's not only deadly to chickens, but can jump and, and transmit human to human and cause the next human pandemic. The risk of large-scale factory farmings increases the risk that we, or the likelihood that we might have a pandemic, particularly of influenza in the future. This pandemic has been very severe, but this is not necessarily the big one. La gripe porcina, que mató a medio millón de personas, se originó en un criadero de cerdos. Se cree que el sida y el virus del ébola vienen de la ingesta de animales salvajes y el MERS de la leche y carne de camellos. Se sospecha que el SARS se originó en un mercado de animales vivos, al igual que la pandemia del COVID-19. También se cree que la gripe aviar se originó en criaderos de pollo y en mercados de animales vivos, y que el virus del sarampión se originó en granjas de vacas. People know now what a global pandemic feels like, and they've seen the effects. They will be feeling the effects for many years to come, and this is a chance, I think, an opportunity to point out that this particular route of infection is, is a, a, a very concerning one. La Organización Mundial de la Salud anunció que la era post antibióticos se acerca. Una era en donde un simple rasguño en el brazo puede llegar a ser fatal. Los milagrosos antibióticos que nos salvan la vida están dejando de surtir efecto, no por el uso excesivo por parte de los humanos, sino porque se los damos a diario a billones de animales de granja. for six years, one thing I know is that if people knew what happened in the production of their food, they wouldn't eat meat. So one of the things that we would hit every day was pus nodules, tumors, cysts. It was something that we would hit on a daily basis. Having worked in a supermarket chain, I was, I saw this firsthand every single day. So here's one that's running along the shoulder blade. Oh. Yeah, that is what I remember in the butchery. It comes out like a thick toothpaste. I remember that every single day. That's interesting to hear you had that experience yeah. all the way over there, because in the UK, exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, we would see that on a daily basis. But th those people who say it's uh, it's not my butcher does this, yeah. they need to open their eyes, because yeah. the fair butcher's being honest with them. We know. Yeah. We both know. We and were and, in, and we were any in honest butcher is going to admit yeah. it. They're not going to want to tell the public because it's going to affect their business. Yeah. But it is a fact. And me yeah. working in multiple butcheries, I saw these common trends across the board. So I know that it wasn't just isolated to the one that I was working in. It was across the board for me. People need to reconnect with what they're eating and the whole process that we were we we're yeah. talking about here of how that food gets to them um, is hidden from them and it's hidden for a reason because if they saw it it would most definitely make them want to think harder about what they're eating. A medida que nuestros océanos y atmósfera comienzan a calentarse, los ciclos del agua del planeta comienzan a cambiar. Climate change changes the water cycles of the planet. The heat that's being generated is forcing the precipitation into the clouds, so we're getting more concentrated precipitation in our clouds and more dramatic, extreme, and unpredictable water events all over the world. 
En el norte de la remota isla de Taiwán, ubicada en el Pacífico, vive el pueblo Atayal, en lo alto de las montañas. Taiwán es un país acostumbrado al clima extremo, pero en los últimos años, la fuerza y la frecuencia de los tifones han aumentado. Esto ha tenido un efecto devastador en el pueblo Atayal y su forma de vida. Mientras gran parte del mundo ha estado experimentando niveles crecientes de inundaciones extremas, en muchos lugares está sucediendo lo contrario. Gran parte del mundo sufre de sequías extremas que destruyen miles de toneladas de cultivos porque los agricultores no tienen suficiente agua para sus campos. I'm definitely worried about the future of our farm. I think um, we're seeing, you know, much more, uh, many more swings in climate than we've seen in the past. But we want to use uh, all the land that we have to grow food. Um, but we haven't been able to just because of the uh, the shortages of water. It'll have an impact on food supply and prices and uh, availability. And so estimates now are between 500,000 to over a million acres of farmland that'll come out of production in California. Almería, al sur de España, hay 31,000 hectáreas de cultivos de hortalizas en invernaderos. Almería produce la mitad de las frutas y verduras frescas de Europa, esenciales para el abastecimiento del sistema alimentario del continente. Preocupantemente, hace 20 años que España sufre sequías. Los expertos sugieren que este fenómeno está estrechamente relacionado con el cambio climático. En términos de agua, pues la verdad que... En términos de agua, la verdad es que la droga en España ha sido una completa catástrofe. Nuestras árboles están decreciendo en grandes cantidades. El año pasado, en la zona que estamos ahora, no había casi nada de árboles. La gente no se que el sistema de está colapsando. Como resultado por el cambio en el sistema climático global, la sequía en África se ha intensificado. Ríos y lagos que abastecen a cientos de millones con agua potable comienzan a secarse. Los nuevos conflictos por estos recursos menguantes han causado el principio de un éxodo masivo hacia el norte de personas desesperadas por sobrevivir. Estos refugiados climáticos arriesgan todo para que ellos y sus familias lleguen a lo que ven como las cosas seguras de Europa. En respuesta a esta migración masiva moderna, España ha construido una valla enorme que recorre la frontera sur en Melilla. Miles de refugiados se agolpan en las vallas fronterizas, desbordando a la policía española. Se predice que este patrón migratorio aumentará. Parece cada vez más claro que nuestro mundo está mal preparado para afrontarlo. El 
puerto de Gobi en Mongolia se expande cada vez más como una bestia hambrienta que devora todo lo que encuentra a su paso. Muchos de los lagos que abastecen a la población y a la vida salvaje se han secado ya. Si los lagos siguen desapareciendo, la población se verá forzada a dejar sus hogares y a instalarse en lugares extraños y remotos. Sayhan <tose> People talk about how much fresh water we use for hydro fracking. 700 billion gallons globally is wasted on fracking. So 700 billion gallons. Sounds like a lot. But animal agriculture, the production of animals that we use for meat around the globe uses 70 trillion gallons of fresh water a year. Hundreds of thousands of times as much as fracking. And, and, and we give the, the cows and the chickens the good stuff, right? They don't get the Flint, Michigan, lead, tainted, condoms floating in it water. They get the top shelf stuff because we don't want to screw up our sausage links. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, oh, here's the part. I'm a vegetarian and pigs are people too, meh. But no, let's ignore how the animals are treated in our factory torture farming. Let's pretend they're treated amazing for just a minute. It's like a celebrity backstage at the Oscars. They're just being fawned over and they get swag bags with free Apple watches. Point is, you should still be upset about this because Animal agriculture is killing us. And corporate media is fantastically pathetic on this topic. They never mention meat production. They never mention that a quarter pounder takes 660 gallons of fresh water to create. That's the, that's the equivalent of showering for two months. So one usually underestimated impact of uh, livestock production is the huge amounts of fresh water required uh, for that production to be maintained and to be increased. The problem is that in many places, uh, water is being used much faster than the natural renewal rates. Overall, in the world, uh, 1.8 billion people are living in areas with severe water scarcity. The livestock sector is the single biggest water user in the world. One third of the water use in the world is being used for producing animal products, meat and dairy. And it's not because those animals drink so much, it's really because there's a lot of water required to make the feed for the animals. If we want enough fresh water for future generations, water alone dictates that we must change our diet away from meat and dairy. A nivel mundial, vemos evidencias de un cambio global hacia los alimentos de origen vegetal. Esto nos da algo de esperanza. En el 2021, un récord de 580 mil personas se anotó para participar en la campaña de Veganuary en Reino Unido. Hoy se estima que más de 4 millones de personas en el Reino Unido son veganas. En Canadá, se estima que el 10% de la población es vegana o vegetariana. En los Estados Unidos, más del 50% de los jefes de cocina agregaron opciones veganas a sus menús. En los últimos tres años, el estilo de vida vegano aumentó un 600%. A few years ago, it was quite a challenge to get hold of good vegan food, but today we're pretty much sport for choice and there are vegan options everywhere. Mm, wow, thanks. It tastes like a normal hot dog. Is it a normal hot dog? Like, as in, like, or is this, like, plant based or something? Is it... So it is actually plant based, mm. yeah. So it's really it. nice. I prefer it because Do I don't really eat meat that much, so this is good. Okay. I like meat and it tastes good. Yeah. For not being meat. Mm. Mm. Would you be happy with that? 
you yeah, know. it'd be so. I love meat too much. So I feel like if I went plant-based, I'd miss it. But if this like stuff tastes the same, yeah. I'd be very happy with this. It yeah. is, yeah. <laughs> that's our good burger. You Thank you. It would interest you to know that that's completely plant based. And I wouldn't know. So that I would definitely. Wow. That's a winner. Yeah, I'm amazed. If burgers always tasted like that, would you be happy to just not eat a beef burger? Yeah, again? no, I got good veg yeah. Yeah? I'd like you to tell me which one of these nuggets is plant based and which one is real meat. hard to say which one is... <laughs> they taste exactly the same, honestly. These are not the chicken. No. That's interesting. Which one of this is animal meat? And which one of this is plant-based? Meat or not meat? You're not sure? No. You're not sure? Yeah, you're not, yeah, I'm not sure. Meat. You? Yes. Are uh, wrong. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. But you think the second one was chicken? Yeah. The second one was actually plant-based. No way. Yeah, and the first one no was chicken. Way. Yeah. Okay, I didn't... No, I, <laughs> I couldn't have guessed that. I definitely thought the first one. Yeah, definitely. It seems that changing what we eat to a more sustainable diet can also coincidentally be very beneficial to our health. There is a growing understanding that we can actually prevent and in many cases even reverse some of our most common diseases all through a shift towards a whole food vegan diet. Humans can survive on many different kinds of diet but many decades of research has now shown us that the best way of not just surviving but truly thriving is on a whole food plant-based diet. A human can be healthy on a plant-based diet without any animal products. The major dietetic associations around the world, including the British Dietetic Association, have produced statements to say exactly that, that a diet made up of whole plant foods is healthy for humans for all stages of their lives. And not only can they be healthy, but they can restore or reclaim their health adopting a plant-based diet. There are certain areas, certain populations around the world that have extraordinary health and longevity. For example, the largest number of centenarians, people that live over 100, these so-called blue zones. What's really interesting about the blue zones, they actually have more centenarians than anywhere else in the world. And a centenarian is someone that lives at least 100 years. Uh, but, but what's really interesting about the Blue Zones is when people reach these advanced ages, they are still productive. So the Blue Zones have taught us a lot. And the bottom line is we really want to try to emulate what the people of the Blue Zones are doing. Las cinco regiones conocidas como zonas azules son Okinawa en Japón, Cerdeña en Italia, Icaria en Grecia, Nicoya en Costa Rica, y Loma Linda en California. So the question is, well, what do they all have in common? They have a predominantly plant-based diet. They have a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, soy, lentils, chickpeas. They have a diet rich in all these nutrients, and that's one thing that they have in common. So the EPIC study is the European Perspective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition. It followed over half a million individuals from 10 European countries for more than 15 years. Those in the EPIC study that were eating predominantly plant-based or eating high levels of fruits and vegetables lived longer, had lower incidence of cancer and heart disease. About 2,500 of the individuals in the EPIC Oxford only ate plant food, so they were vegan. Um, and even though they weren't the most healthy vegans or healthy plant eaters, you could show that these plant eaters were healthier, um, they had a lower incidence of heart disease, diabetes and cancer. From everything we have discovered on this journey, it seems that moving away from animal foods to plant-based foods instead can not only give us a whole host of amazing health benefits, but also gives us a chance to be able to leave a sustainable planet for future generations to come. Perhaps the single most meaningful change that we can make as individuals is ultimately deciding what ends up each day on our plates. We are running out of time. The world community 
must acknowledge that animal agriculture is the most destructive industry on our planet. We can't wait for government policies and other organizations to create a better life for ourselves. We need to stand up now and make our voices heard. Globally, for the typical consumer, avoiding meat and dairy is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on Earth. Without addressing uh, what we eat, we simply won't make it. This is a number one priority. This is a next step in taking responsibility for our communities, our planet, our biosphere, our fellow species. People say, what can I do as an individual? It feels overwhelming. Well, you can make individual choices. We all can. Our individual choices affect the collective choices. When you hear about airplanes and cars, and we're still going to use those things. But the choices we make in our diet, this agricultural business where we use animals as the primary source of protein, the one thing I think we can all do is, and individuals, is make our own individual choices, how we're going to live, how we're going to eat. Plant-based diet makes all the difference in the world. Just make some choices that are good for you, and being good for you will be good for the planet. Este planeta es nuestro hogar y lo que suceda depende de nosotros. La historia nos ha demostrado que cuando estamos juntos, unidos por una misma causa, podemos lograr grandes cosas. Tenemos la oportunidad ante nosotros de construir un mundo en el que podamos prosperar. Pero el reloj no se detiene y el tiempo se acaba.